Welcome to the pilot episode of the Cross Platform Podcast, the podcast that aims to reminisce, relive, and maybe even teach you a few things about the old games of our childhood and the new games of the future. Today, we'll be going on a journey of nostalgia through Halo Combat Evolved, talking about its history, its story, and the fond memories we have for it. Halo Combat Evolved, or Halo 1, is a game made in 2001, released on the original Xbox as a launch title. However, from Halo to where it all started is an interesting story. A story that all began with a game called Monkey Nuts. Monkey Nuts? Unfortunately, the original name for Halo was indeed Monkey Nuts. Uh, later, it was changed to Blam! Exclamation mark. Wait, was this just a different game? Did they have like monkeys fighting aliens and they were like, hey, let's put this, let's put this monkey in a big green suit and we're not going to show his face because he's a monkey? Maybe John's a monkey. That would have made for a good game sadly instead they made halo <laughs> instead they made but what they did make way back when bungie studio started in the early 1990s was things like myth 2 the minotaur and the labyrinth of crete and marathon these were before my time so not knowing about these ones are they more like doom 3d style yeah myth 2d was a sort things of wandering around puzzle platformer and oh, okay. sort of, yeah, Marathon was a bit more of a Doom-style shooter. Um, but in 1997, Bungie starts work on Monkey Nuts, later named Blam. And they they went, they took this game, they pitched it to Apple, to Steve Jobs. And Jobs had it. He, Jobs liked it. He put it up at the Macworld Expo in 1999, where... It, it went through some, some more name-changing iterations to The Santa Machine. What? The Santa Machine? I'm not sure. I'm not sure why it was called The Santa Machine. I don't know if Santa had any... was going to play a, any role in the story. What the gifts would be? Um, Solipsis and The Crystal Palace <laughs> were some working titles for the game, and it was originally pitched now in 1999 to be an RTS, a real-time strategy game, in the, the vein of StarCraft and WarCraft. Sure, that, well, that makes sense, because they did make RTS games for Halo, right? Halo Wars. So they didn't, yeah, they didn't release later that, on, but they did get their eventually. That makes sense. Yeah. And it stayed an RTS for a, a while, a few years. It was about the year 2000, somewhere through, Apple and, and Bungie had a, a disagreement or the rights got shifted over in some way and it ended up going on its own again, Bungie Studios. It turned at some point during all of that into a third-person shooter and it picked up the name Halo based loosely on the, the early ideas they had for a story about a, you know, disc world, effectively. Right, okay. And then midway through, uh, at E3 2000... It got picked up by Microsoft. Uh, Bungie, at that point, were struggling for money. They ended up having to sell off their shares to take two interactive. They they needed a big hit, a big successful game to pull them back from the, the brink and bankruptcy. And come 2000, Halo was picked up by Microsoft and led into being this now third-person open-world shooter open world. that was being pitched pitched to release on the Xbox, this new launch title on a launching console that nobody had ever heard of. Wow, what a game that would have been. Open world third person Halo. GTA Master Chief. That would have been great. Exactly. I don't know, maybe that could have led on to some sort of open world, sort of MMO style game, early EverQuest oh, maybe. don't tease me. Why is that not a thing? MMO Halo oh. universe. But... It did not become that, as halfway through uh, development now in the year 2000, they, they had to bring the scope down significantly from a third third person, big open world game into just a, a first person, linear sort of corridor shooter almost, but not quite corridor, big open levels and things. Um, but these changes happened right at the very end of the of development and the script rewrites were happening right up to the last minute. Voice actors had to rush in to re-record over old dialogue, record new dialogue. The entire soundtrack to the game was developed in only three days by 
Marty O'Donnell. Wow. Those iconic songs in three days. What a beast. Songs that remain now even that are these recognisable hits develop very quickly. After that, they all the way through this development, they were planning to have this, a big multiplayer component to it. And unfortunately, by the launch of the Xbox One... Or the, not the, the Xbox original. <laughs> no, no, you're right, Microsoft's wrong. They were planning to release it with multiplayer. Multiplayer was never added on to the Xbox uh, original, and so that whole aspect of the game was scrapped. Damn. I think it, it did have capability, right? The, the classic Xbox. I think eventually, yeah, it may have gotten an Xbox Live component. I don't think it launched with right. it. Halo, as a launch title, definitely had to cut its multiplayer from... Uh, from launch later yeah. in Halo 2 uh, which was also on the original Xbox that that did have multiplayer mm, and yeah. I think that was maybe yeah. where it sort of got this big following uh, but I recall Halo must have been in about 2001 maybe 2002 when I was at a Toys R Us and they had the big display cases that let you test games so you'd go Rest up. in peace, Toys R Us. F. But you'd be able to go up and and sit in a big booth and play. Uh, you know, they it would be almost set up like a, like a racing game in an arcade, but you you wouldn't be in a car. You would just go in there and sit there yeah, and play it, play Halo or Metroid. Yeah, your parents would distract and... you with that. Well, they hope you don't see the bikes, and they go off and buy what they need, and they yeah. quickly nap you before they leave. Exactly, and so I would be in there, and I sat there, and I played this game about this big futuristic robot going through this futuristic world, doing all these great things, and at the end, I point to the game on the shelf, and I'm like, that's the game. That's the game I want. My dad looks over and, and see that they must have confused the placement of the things on the shelves, and I was pointing to Halo. Little did I know I'd, just, I'd been playing Metroid <laughs> the entire time. And so Christmas rolls around. I open up. I see that I've gotten this game that I played. And oh, it's, it's going to be so much fun. And it was. Uh, I, d I got about two thirds of the way through the game before I even realized it wasn't oh, the same no. thing. Um, and I think I only realized because somebody else, I went to their house and they were playing Metroid. And I was like, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> your Metroid looks very different to mine. You've got a very different version of the game. And so, but I still, I loved it. Did you not think, did you not think, why am I playing a man now? You know, Samus is very, very well, feminine character, even still in armour. Not, uh, maybe. I mean, to the mind of a, however old I was at that point, it was apparently familiar enough um, <laughs> that it just, just completely focused on passed me by. I think my first experience with Halo 1, it definitely wasn't on Xbox Classic. I did have an Xbox Classic, but I only had a very few select games on it. One of them was Black, I don't know if you remember that game. Uh, another first-person shooter. Yeah. I think it was a predecessor to Call of Duty. I don't really remember who made it. Not predecessor as in it was a prequel or anything, but... But I didn't play Halo 1 until I played it on PC. Quite a long time later, really. I mean, Halo 2 would probably have already been out for years before I played Halo 1. I definitely didn't play it on release. I absolutely loved it. I'd never played a game that had this this style of world, what blew my mind the most was the, the physical shape of the world, you know, we're so used to the world being flat, and you know, I'm joking, but having, being inside, on any disc world, but not being outside of it, but being inside of it, and when you're playing, you're outside, you can look up and see the other half of the planet, and as you're always going one way, you always seem to be progressing along the planet in some form, I always thought as a kid, like, oh, could I go all the way round? You know, forgetting loading screens are a thing and instancing is, is, exists. All I wanted to do was get in a warthog and drive the full loop of the planet. And I, I hope one Halo game yeah. actually does that. That that would be good. Maybe an MMO. I I remember, yeah, seeing the, the ring above and thinking, I wonder if I could drive that, especially on that first level. Uh, when you're on the, the planet for the first time, on the ring mm, for the first yeah. time, you look up out of the, the pelican or the, the escape pod. Yeah, yeah. And you see it first above. Oh, you've got the banshees flying around. You're like, oh, these must be friends. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't been introduced to the enemies yet properly. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, these big purple flying things. Why am I dying? 
So as anybody who has played it will be familiar with, the game begins on a, a shuttle drifting through space, disabled, boarded by aliens. You are a, this, this cybernetically enhanced, helmeted warrior of the 26th century. And you have to pair up with the ship's AI to fight back this estranged insectoid race. That, unfortunately, however, is the plot to Marathon, uh, the 1994 game developed by Bungie. It's definitely Halo. Yeah, distinctly similar to Halo in many ways, uh, highlighting the v- sort of huge inspiration that they took from their own game. Uh, Marathon was developed by Bungie, Halo was developed by Bungie, but it sort of is a testament to the expediency of which they had to make Halo's plot near the end there where they were sort of rushing through those script rewrites yeah, yeah. you can almost see that they had to borrow a lot from the things that they'd already created wow I'm glad they did though yeah and it's a great world that they were borrowing from and they used it and built upon it to to create something more than the sum of its parts than the things that they borrowed from previously and the the inspirations that make up Halo are quite obvious in the way the game's laid out in its story and you can see not only from Marathon but from Discworld, Terry Pratchett, Discworlds and the Ringworlds are obviously very similar. Yeah. Surrealist sort of themes uh sort of pervading into Halo um in interesting ways. Things like the Grunt Birthday Party, you know, <laughs> sort of the surrealist theme. Yeah. Wouldn't be Halo without very it. sort of Terry Pratchett style sort of comedic sci-fi bleeding through and the way that the the AI would react to you, you know, grunts would get up and start screaming and run away. Yeah, calling you the alien, right? I remember that, they would scream oh, as it goes on they start calling you the demon or something as you get a better name for yourself. Mm. But yeah, some of them would be stupid enough to come at you, but most of them would get up and run away. And then you get the, the random the, the dual grenade ones. They were fun. They blow themselves yeah, up. Yeah, and sometimes you get like eight of them running at you, and you just have to shoot the first one because he's going to blow up his friends. Yeah, gameplay mechanics there, uh, as well inspired heavily by Serious Sam. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, grunts running towards you with a, a bomb in each hand and then exploding, uh, along with, obviously, things from Half-Life, sort of the basic structure of the story in Halo begins in a very similar way to Half-Life. Um, it uses very similar text and fonts uh, in its introduction. And the story noticed. itself yeah, the story itself is quite similar in that it begins with, with one enemy, you know, the Covenant, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, the, the humans have to fight against the Covenant. About halfway through, or three quarters of the way through, we're introduced to the Flood, and they arrive to attack both the Covenant and the humans. They were some scary enemies early on playing that game. Now with yeah. the you know, graphics and smooth FPS and everything, not as bad. But when you played it back in the day and it was a bit choppy and the animations were quite rough. The the flood, the little, what are they called? Spores, maybe? The little crawling ones where you get just a yeah. mass of them. They used to creep me the hell out, man. They were on the, the walls, the ceiling, everything. The more... Was the I think it was called the level? Oh, the very last level of the game, I think, is called the Moor. yeah, with the flood, and they were all chasing you in the warthog, oh, right? As you're trying to get away, yeah, and everything's yeah. exploding around trying you. To the pelican get goes down to the pillar, trying to get to the pillar of autumn to detonate or yeah. something like that, or to stop guilty spat. You know, the, the same thing. It's always guilty spat. Yeah. So the the flood definitely when you first are introduced to them as well, if you remember, oh, there's that scene very early on with the, the captain. Captain Keys? The the captain that is taken by the flood. Yeah, 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 Captain Keys. You, you find him and he's been assimilated, basically, and he's he's kind of part of the of the hive minds now. And you punch his head in to yeah. crap his memories or something. I can't, there's something in his head. <laughs> you don't see it quite. You see Chief in the cutscene punching in, but you don't see the gore too much. <laughs> Hi, friend. <laughs> very alien. Uh, very aliens, you know. Yeah, uh, definitely. Inspirations yeah. And a little bit Starship Troopers, maybe. Oh, definitely. The, all the Marines look 
identical to the troopers. And they're just as useless too. Yeah, as of course. I think it wasn't until until about Halo 3 where you could sort of equip the marines with much better weapons. Oh, yeah. Sticking them on the back of a mongoose of the rocket launcher to take down a scarab. I remember. Yeah. Yeah, but in Halo 1 they were fodder, really. They were a bit bit more of a thing to just progress the story. They would be in the cutscenes and you'd see them get blown up. But outside of that, you never really got to work with them much. There's one scene... Well, it's not a scene. It's You, you play it. You, um, I think it's in the mission where you first meet the Flood. You walk into a room and you, you haven't met the Flood yet, but things are a bit off. You keep finding a lot of Covenant bodies that you haven't killed. And it's like, well, there's no other Master Chief around, so what the hell's going on, right? And you find this Marine uh, sat against the wall with a pistol just firing wildly at you, screaming at you to get back, and he's completely lost it. And he doesn't recognise you at all. And I thought I could knock the guy out, because he's actually hitting me and he's actually doing damage. So I was like, I don't want to kill the guy, so I thought, you know, I'll you know melee him and maybe knock him out and he'll give me some magnum ammo and I can come get him later, perhaps. No, I just killed the guy. Just killed the poor marine. Uh, I thought, well, how can I go on now? How? So that, that's a reload, you know. You've got a quick load there, I can't go on knowing I've killed a marine. As useless as they are. They, they are... You have to sort of shepherd them. Yeah, I, I kind of felt like a bit of a, a guardian to them. I'd save them as much as I could. I think the the very first mission actually reinforces that quite well, if I remember it rightly. You you find a warthog. Um, I think you can run it, but the, the map is huge, and you have to you're going down this valley, and there's a small river through the middle, and you break off through these rocky corridors, where sometimes it wouldn't allow you to take a vehicle, and you'd find a, a crashed pelican or some remaining marines. And you'd have to fight back a couple waves of Covenant. And then the Marines would be saved and the Pelican would come pick them up or some of them would follow you, they'd jump in your vehicle. I think they tried to hijack your vehicle more than anything, but if you got there first, they would just jump in and help. But a lot of it was you always finding helpless Marines in completely hopeless situations all through the game. And you're just saving them accidentally, whether you want to or not, really. But I think it reinforced that feeling of being Master Chief and being an absolute badass. You're overcoming impossible odds to kill these hundreds of aliens who outgun you and out outman you right and then you're saving these marines at the same time and it's just i'm an absolute war machine i'm an unstoppable killing thing it definitely pulled off power fantasy through both yeah you know, the gameplay the the story the way that you were sort of the the person that the the marines would look to you know, to get things done. You could hear them in as they were sort of running into rooms, they'd be shouting. I remember at points if you would come into a room you'd hear a marine in the distance shouting, Yay, chief's here. Yeah. Hey, things it's the like chief, that. we're saved. Yeah. And the Spartans, um uh, and the Covenant you could see their influence from things like Ender's Game, the Flood, possibly, uh, based on a Christopher Rowley book called the vang which is also perhaps where the name master chief came from oh really yeah and so the inspirations that halo oh, took God, no are, are many um but it definitely sort of mixes them together in a way that it's uh, wears its influences on its sleeve almost uh one of the more obscure references that halo draws on is a latin epic um called the it's called the Aenid. the Aenid. You're going back a bit now and well here's where it gets interesting it's written by virgil um now it's not a very latin name <laughs> in well if you remember i'm pretty sure that in halo odst you meet the character virgil uh, he's a doctor right uh, I, I think no. he's one of the aliens. Oh, I'm getting mixed up with a uh, certain Fallout character called Virgil. If you remember in ODST, the sort of like floating squid. Gosh, no. They're sort of like big sure. flying jellyfish. Wow, no. You have to protect them. I did them. play it, but oh, well, I definitely didn't pay attention. I just remember playing ODST and being annoyed that I can't take, you know, a whole fucking tank shell and just shrug it off as my armor recharges. Yeah. Because I'm one of the useless marines now. Well, a much better marine. But yeah, it definitely wasn't used to the lower health. Definitely a stark contrast between Halo 1, even into Halo 2 and Halo 3, uh, in terms of not only the, the gameplay, or not only the, the shield regeneration and things like that, but the the 
influences from Marathon sort of fell away slightly uh, as Halo 1 progressed, but one of the core themes that stuck with the plot of Halo was artificial intelligence, uh, sort of transhumanism, and Marathon had something which was called Rampancy, which the artificial intelligence, the holograms, would undergo. And that would be effectively sort of them going crazy, something that we later see Cortana experiencing in the Halo games. That is probably the biggest carryover from the the two. Yeah, I was going to say Rampancy sounds very familiar. I distinctly remember the scenes in Halo 3, I believe, where Cortana starts to get affected by it. Yeah. She's just being very annoying in your face all the time. So obviously the influences from Marathon let them build the basis for what Halo became. Halo itself then became a lot more and quite quickly after its release it gained a reputation for being the maybe the benchmark for shooters. Oh did it just. Did it just. Yeah man I mean it got the label well every game after it was compared to it as is this a possible Halo killer? It had such a high standard that it, no, it, nothing mattered. It didn't matter how what the game was or how good it was. It was, can it dethrone Halo? That was the benchmark. The bar was set so high from Halo. And rightly so, I think. Mm, Halo clones, I remember every time a game would come out, I was like, oh, it's just yeah, a clone yeah. of Halo. Crisis released. Oh, it's just a, a clone of Halo. Oh, it's just Master Chief for better graphics. Yeah, yeah. And the constant comparisons to any first person shooter that came out however the comparisons somewhat justified in that modern shooters if you say they picked up around 2000 2001 of what we expect to be in a shooter today obviously doom is the the real what's the granddaddy benchmark defining it set the groundwork for all shooters to come right and marathon yeah, was heavily yeah. inspired by doom in its gameplay and halo was then heavily inspired by marathon in its gameplay However, it did enough to revolutionise the way first-person shooters worked that it had this huge impact on, you know, Xbox and all first-person shooters really to come. In what sort of ways? What do you think were the main, the main factors that were carried on? The things it did so well that everyone copied? I think in terms of the gameplay, what is obvious first before that is that it did begin as an RTS and right. the, the fact that it began as an RTS maybe even lent something to the uniqueness of the game to the the gameplay uh, being able to transcend just the standard first person shooter and that is in an RTS it's very clearly defined that there are sort of, you know, you have multiple teams, multiple sides. So if we take StarCraft as a sort of RTS of that time, right, you have the Protoss, yeah. you have the Zerg, you have the Terror, and they split down this this line. Oh, I see. So it just, it just parallels the human covenant, yeah. flat, right? In a way, I suppose it does. But what it also lets you do is establish these sort of dividing lines between each race and then... In Halo 1, each of these races do have their own units. You can sort of categorise them into an RTS structure, right? So you can say, right, the, the humans flying units is, is the, the Pelican and the Covenant flying unit is the Banshee. The Covenant right. uh, tank unit is the Wraith. The human tank unit is the Scorpion. What's their fast ground vehicle? It's the Warthog compared to the Ghost. Oh, I see. You're saying they each had their own uh, opposite unit. Yeah, exactly, that in a very RTS. Against. Yeah, this see. would counter yeah. this sort of way. Yeah. And so that allowed, you know, not only the sort of integration of vehicle combat into the game, which was done through third person, but it also lended each side a identifiable sort of uniqueness to the Covenant, to the humans. You could tell them apart at a glance. Everything was very easy to delineate. You know, you've, if you saw a scorpion coming over the hill, you knew exactly that it was the marines coming to reinforce you. And if you saw a wraith, you would dread that you were about to get blown up from halfway across the map. <laughs> yeah. There is a, a little bit of disparity in the infantry units, though, because the Covenant have quite a wide range of units, whereas the humans just have the marines and the occasional Spartan. Yeah. 
And that is sort of an issue that came up later on when it became an RTS again in Halo Wars, where your sort of main ground units, you know, was sort of a squad of marines, whereas the Covenant could have hunters and they could have uh, elites with energy swords or they could have cloaked yeah. elites with energy swords or they could have grunts and grunts oh, wow. and elites. All of these things coming together later in Halo Wars, but early on in Halo 1, the levels... I would say hugely sprawling, probably compared to a lot of other shooters at the time. Oh yeah, some some maps were far too big. You One could of my get lost. Complaints of Halo One is that some of the levels were far too big, far too big. Especially the um, assault on the control room. I think it's called mission. You're in the snow and you have to keep going from sort of. I don't know, structure to structure, if you like, built into the mountains. And each time you go into one of these structures, it's the same layout, and you're following the little arrows on the floor. You go down a corridor, and you've got a sort of round-ish room with enemies in the middle, and some of the doors are blocked off. And then you get to a control room, interact with something, and there's like another five or six of these you have to do. You go to the next one, it's the same layout. Go to the next one, same layout. And then you have to... I think it might be the next mission, or the same mission, but you've got the bridges. So you have to cross yeah. a big bridge, go from one mountain to the next, same room on the other side, another bridge, same room. Well, the mission was, I'd say, quite difficult, because you've just got jackals with beam rifles absolutely everywhere, and the occasional hunter. It was just, just felt too long. And as one of my very few complaints of Halo, is that, that mission I really didn't like. So while, yeah, it completely blew all the, all the other shooters out of the water in terms of sprawling maps, it may, could argue it was downside to it yeah a little bit too big maybe it, i mean if you think of its competitors at the time or the games that were released around it you know you had things like medal of honor um time splitters you had i think red faction half-life one wow. things like that serious sam well. yeah these games operation flashpoint these oh, shooters yeah that were released very sort of close to or around where halo one was was launched and yeah, a lot of these have limited levels, a lot smaller levels, um, a lot more contained, a lot less space to go off and explore and get lost. And I remember that on the first level of Halo, where you are on the ship, right, it's quite close corridors, uh, you're sort of navigating through. When you have to go into the vents, it's almost Doom-like. Oh it's yeah, sort of... you'd have the main corridors and they'd be blocked off, so you'd have to find like the sub sort of service corridors. At yeah. the sides, you have arbiters or wow, elite, sorry, with energy swords waiting there for you. Yeah, and that was very much that first level was very much a lot more like the games from that era. You know, that is a very lot more like Time Splitters and Medal of Honor and Alien Resurrection. It was close corridors, linear, moving through from place to place, and then when you crash land on the planet, you crash land on the ring, suddenly. Right, you step out of that ship for the first time, the doors open after the, the crash as Chief is the only survivor, and you come out to beams of light and this huge sprawling ring in front of you and above you and behind you and this huge chasm and banshees flying overhead. And it's just a sudden, oh, this isn't small corridors <laughs> this yeah. isn't you know passageways this is a big open immediately big open area and you go up and you go up through that valley and you're presented again with another huge open area there's only very small gameplay mechanics to guide you in that valley i remember it was just small posts with lights on that yeah really the only indication of where you might need to go otherwise it was just up to you good luck here's your rifle Whilst the story, or whilst the, the gameplay was still sort of linear, you know, you, you've still, once you reached, you know, from A to B, once you'd gotten to B, that was the end. But it was the sort of the way that it let you dynamically get from A to B that was so unique and interesting and fun to do. Yeah, definitely. And as the game progressed from that first level, you would use a pistol, assault rifle, but very quickly you were starting to pick up alien weapons. Very quickly you were starting to add the introduction to vehicles and air support would come in and, and reinforce you and you would be given new weapons and there's this constant progression mm. of getting new vehicles and being rewarded with new weapons and, and being able to steal from the aliens and use their weapons against them. Yeah, it definitely quickly became a combined arms type of skirmish warfare than just you surviving on your own. I did quite enjoy that yeah. build-up. And then when you're given your first Scorpion, that's when you truly feel badass. The first time, yeah, you get to drive the tanks. And even the first time, when 
and for a, for a lot of the game, I remember that it was a very sort of horizontal game. You know, you would be going, you'd be progressing through levels, and you would be in tanks, or you'd be in warhogs, or you'd be just as chief. And then you would constantly be being harassed by banshees. You'd have to shoot them down with rocket launchers or things like that. Yeah. But when it suddenly added this vertical element to it, where they gave you a banshee for the first time, <laughs> and you take off, and suddenly there's a whole new dimension to the game. And the first time trying to control one of those things was a disaster. I crashed that thing so many times. Yeah. Just smashing into build, or even just trying to run over grunts <laughs> the moment you got it and just smashing into buildings. <laughs> and trying to run away from you. Crashing into the walls. Oh, man. So the those RTS elements, those that level design, that level of polish on a game, and it was, it had its bugs, but... There were few, as far as I can remember. I remember encountering, encountering very few of them when I played it. Originally, uh, especially on the PC later on uh, in the years, there were very few bugs. A few sort of um, little glitches you could try to do. I remember spending maybe an hour when I first got it on PC back in the day trying to get inside a pelican just because right. I so wanted to be in a pelican. Okay, what well, you're just not allowed. I don't think I ever tried. Is that a lot of them land and the marines jump in? Oh no! I think yeah. you can stand on the 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 door of it, right? You can stand on the ramp. You used to be able to actually sit in the seat. <laughs> they just oh, wouldn't right. take off if you did. Oh wow! Okay, I never knew that. Yeah, so I would spend. I think if the pelican in Halo One. I think it was called Echo Nineteen. Uh, Echo Four Nineteen. Sounds it. Sounds very familiar. Yeah. And yeah, it would drop you off on the silent cartographer. And you could turn around immediately and I think try and get back in or try and jump up and climb back into the pelican. <laughs> no, don't leave me. I Take me with you. I don't want to be here. I had this dream that it would fly me around the map and I'd be able to just, you know, fly around in the sky in this pelican. Oh, but God. Alas, it would not be for another, I think, five games um, before they actually let you fly in pelicans but they did eventually I think it's Halo let you pilot a pelican 4 perhaps you're flying between all those spires when you're on earth there was an easter egg in Halo Reach that let you fly a pelican oh really mm -hmm. there was an easter egg that you had to do with the hornets I believe that let you glitch your way into a pelican it was some sort of easter egg and you could you could fly it around the map in multiplayer and pick up your oh, friend wow. and drop them off uh, but it wasn't yeah until Halo 4 where it became I think part of part of it I can't quite remember I think it's 4 but yeah, those elements, the the RTS elements, the level design, going towards making this really unique, interesting shooter. One of its kind at the time, almost. Uh, so different to everything else that was around. It no wonder, really, the impact that it had outside of not only the Xbox, but outside of gaming, or the sphere of, you know, what was gaming then. It, going on to create things like Red vs. Blue, and oh, God. later down the line to create things like Arby and the Chief, which was a more sort of Halo 2, Halo 3. Wow, I loved that series. With just the little figures just moving them around very obviously. Oh man, that was hilarious. Taking the piss out of Call of Duty for the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Halo 1 birthing Red vs. Blue, and now that company going on to be hugely successful... Uh, you know, separated from Halo, um, and I think yeah, Machinimas. I mean, it, Halo pretty much birthed the classic uh, Breaking Benjamin Machinima <laughs> yes. on YouTube. Yeah, that was more Halo did. Two, though there were some for Halo One. YouTube obviously starting up around two thousand and four, two thousand and five. Before, or, well, I think it was around the same time that Halo Two launched. But I do distinctly remember having. You know, all, all of the original Red vs. Blue was done on Blood Gulch in Halo 1, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably in split screen or local co op. Yeah, I definitely played a lot of Halo 1 multiplayer on PC. I fondly, fondly remember Blood Gulch. The two bases separated by the the big, big pathway down the center. Yup. Capture the Flag? Was that on that map? I think it I was. I think it was, yeah. Yeah, good old classic Capture the Flag. Bring theirs back to yours. I think there was a... I'm not sure it's the same in all uh, Capture the Flag game modes for all games, but if I remember if they had your flag and you had theirs, you couldn't um, put yours in. You couldn't declare your point. You'd have to mm. hold yours at your base while people defended you, while you send off squads to go and kill their flag carrier yeah. holding your flag. So you had to have both to claim it. That's when it got really tense. So speaking of PvP, right, I've got a couple questions. What was your go-to weapon in PvP? 
that weapon that you felt that you could kill anyone with? I think it varied hugely by game on a game to game basis, right? Okay. Uh, but I think Halo One. In Halo One, it had to be the pistol. Oh, the Magnum. Oh, yeah. It had to be the I Magnum. Think it was amazing. With the zoom, right? Just standing halfway across the map with this sniper pistol. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just hitting and taking down shields. Obviously, Chunking the health. the the ultimate combo, of course, was a pistol on your primary weapon and a plasma pistol as your secondary oh, weapon. Oh, yeah. Charge it up and take all the shields away, right? Take the shields away and pop them in the head yeah, once. Yeah. Oh, man. That takes me back. Mine was always the sniper rifle. I was mm. always, always that annoying guy sat at the base with the sniper rifle, just trying to take cheeky shots. And on Blood Gulch, you could see the other base from yours. You could. So you'd always have a sniper war. You'd always have one guy on each side. Because you could jump up on the little pillars and yeah. see perfectly yeah, yeah. into the other side of the map. I mean, if I, if I wasn't sniping, I would just grab a warthog and just drive it into the enemy base. Probably because there's another sniper there who's annoyed me. Now, the only issue I had with the sniper rifle was... Back in the, this was back in the day where the field of view was probably about sixty, <laughs> and that. your frames per second were probably about twenty. Six. On a lucky, on a good day, and the sniper rifle would genuinely take up about sixty percent of the screen <laughs> yeah, on my yeah. tiny little CRTV, <laughs> this tiny little box little that we've been playing it on. And not only that, but it would be in co-op, so you'd be split four ways. Oh, so your no. screen was like the size of. A crisp packet, <laughs> and if you had the sniper equipped on that, there was no chance. That's something we've really lost in gaming, isn't it? Bit of a tangent, but split screen gaming. What happened? Mm. Well, the internet happened, sure, but I mean, no. couch co op in general, right? It's just sort of fallen by the wayside. Those were some of the best gaming memories I have. You know, coming home from school with a few mates. Oh, so and so bought Halo. Let's, let's go. Let's go play. You got four controllers, and you just sit there for hours playing. No one can see what the hell's going on. Everyone's still super competitive. Well, my friends were. Yeah. Nobody wanted to lose. Everyone had to win. As kids do, right? But, oh, that was magic. I remember... This was for Halo 2. I think it was for Halo 2. It might have been for Halo 1. It's going back some years. One of our friends was leaving school to a different school. And our going away party at sort of 13, 12, 13 years old was a big Halo LAN tournament. Oh, Wow whereby, you know, you all bring your Xbox in your little backpack and you set it up and you connect it all with Ethernet cables or whatever the cable was, and you sit there and you play on all on, like, you know, as many TVs as you could jam into a room, and you all play Versus in Halo. Wow, I feel like I missed out. I did not do that. We did that once, and then obviously occasionally it was just sort of, yeah, using the couch co-op, um, split screen, things like that. All of that for Halo 1, obviously having to happen simply because it didn't have that multiplayer yet. Yeah. Um, or at least it didn't launch with that multiplayer ability. Not on the Xbox, at least, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sitting up with some mates after school to, bah, on the weekends, what the parents would let you do. So what you thought was super late, like one, two in the morning. You thought, oh yeah, we'll stay up all night. We're doing all night. We'll stay up 24 hours playing Halo. Turn <laughs> off the cat, turn off the uh, match timer and get those kills going up above 100 Three hours later, you're still killing each other. Yeah. Man, those were the days. Those were the days. Riding around in warthogs, crashing them into each other. <laughs> just running just running that one guy over in the warthog speed. over and over again who never yeah. sees it coming. So going back to the campaign, did you have a favourite mission or least favourite mission in the campaign? I would have to say that the silent cartographer was the best mission. Right, you're going to have to remind, remind me what that one was. Silent Cartographer, if I'm remembering it correctly, is the pelican lands and it drops you on the beach. Oh, God, yeah. I remember and, that one. Yeah. And for some reason, I was obsessed with getting free of the constraint of the map. And so what I would do was a, I would get in a warthog and I would fill it with marines and we would just drive out to sea. <laughs> and we would just see how far we could go in the ocean before the ocean claimed us. <laughs> Unwilling passengers. Yeah. And it was never far, but I sort of had this thing where I was just determined if I go out, at the, if I just time it perfectly, or if you're I just, just do this right... determined to murder Marines, is what you're saying. If I just do this right, I thought, you know what, I'm going to get out the map or I'm going to get to freedom. <laughs> One day I'll reach another mission. Yeah. But yeah, that was a great, this huge sprawling beach... 
where you drive around the outside and they bring in reinforcements and they drop you water. You sort of have to almost this D-Day element to it, right, where you all pile out with all your marines at the start, you smash into the beachhead, you take out all of the guarding covenant and then you continue on until they can bring in reinforcements and they give you the warthogs. You then drive for parts of the mission and it's this mixture between driving sections and, uh, you know walking running sections where you have rocket launchers and shotguns and you sort of have go through all of the different weapons and all the different vehicles yeah that mission definitely utilized a bit of everything that was that's an iconic mission especially the the very first few seconds of the cutscene the intro cutscene for it where you're just watching the pelican fly in anytime i think halo one that's what i think of that cutscene like absolutely iconic and there's one part in that mission that I remember getting stuck on for a very, very long time playing it originally. And I'm not sure, it was probably midway, perhaps towards the end, where you go up a, a small sort of mountain corridor, a very, very, very small chasm you're going through. And it opens up to this, this area with a, you're on like a shelf and there's a building and there's two hunters down there. And you don't know it's coming. So you may not have prepared. I, I certainly didn't. I definitely didn't keep hold of any of the good good weapons. If, if I found a rocket launcher, those next grunts were getting destroyed, right? I never saved the important <laughs> yeah. ammo for important things. I just used everything So when the hunters show up, you're just doomed. Yeah, I, I cringe now if I use a sniper rifle against hunt, uh, grunts or something. Like using that excessive force is such a waste now, but that, that's you know learning FPS over like a decade. But I, I remember being stuck there for so long because I had... I may have just have died or something, so I just had a magnum and an assault rifle, and there's very little that spawns in that area. And these two hunters just kicked my ass for hours. Uh, it was nothing I could do, because the, the, it would just kill you instantly. If one of them punched you, you were dead. Oh, for days, days and days I was stuck there. I think I started the mission again, and then prepped something. Because that, that was... That kicked my ass. I think for um, my least favourite mission, and I would argue probably the worst mission in all of Halo... Has to be oh, the library. That's going to trigger someone. Yeah, and I think rightfully so. They would deserve to be triggered because the library is awful. It is the same three to four corridors, copy pasted, one after the other, and you simply walk from corridor to corridor without vehicles, without variety of weapons, without anything interesting, just shooting flood and defending the guilty spark, or at least uh, the guilty spark has brought you there. And, you know, the the library is full of research that will help you defeat the Flood, right? And he has to, to look for the index in order to activate the Halo rings that will destroy the Flood. Um, however, the index is very, very deep into the library, and so you have to fight your way there with Guilty Spark. And it is the same four corridors, copy-pasted again and again, with no vehicles and nothing of interest. Yeah. So I'm terrible at remembering these levels by name. Uh, but I pulled up a couple images, and yeah, I, I remember this. I, I remember this. And some of the corridors, I remember, didn't have very clearly defined entrances and exits. It would kind of just be a, a corner tucked away in a half an archway, which would be supposedly yeah. the main entrance. But it's so unobvious, you just get stuck in these rooms. You might come in through sort of a ceiling point yeah. almost and drop down and then have to jump back up on another end. And What Halo did perfectly in its gameplay right was was huge sprawling open missions that really gave you a feeling of there are so many solutions that i could could use to solve this problem there's so many routes to the end of this mission it was an illusion yeah definitely for the was. most part it did it well but it was a very good and believable illusion and the library stripped that illusion away and really reminded you that you're in very narrow corridors with very clearly defined routes from a to b um, as another as a tangent as well, the story of the game it's quite bare bones in Halo One. It doesn't really pick up into a uh, explore sort of wider things until Halo Two, Halo Three. The story of Halo One's very very contained. It does have that cliffhanger ending. Um, it does have the minor character right of Sergeant Johnson who was in there as a very minor cameo. Almost. Major. He was a very major. Yeah. He was the best guy. He was the main character, dude. That game yeah. should have been called Sergeant Johnson featuring Master Chief. And his yeah, his role very important uh, as doing I think if you got the legendary ending, he 
he like shook hands with an elite right at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something like that. Uh, but his yeah, but so the, the the role of the flood in Halo One. I mean, I'm not sure if they had, and I doubt they did, a clearly defined sort of direction that the story would go from Halo One to Halo Two to Halo Three. What I imagine more is that they had sort of rough outlines of how the story was going to progress and what would be important, and they sort of wrote around that. Well, there were novels, right, before the games, or were the yeah, novels after? I don't books. really know. Books did start to release, I believe, after. Uh, the original Halo, Halo Combat Evolved in 2001, whether they had planned for it to become this sort of multimedia uh, franchise, I'm not sure. But I do remember going into games and game stations and seeing Halo figures quite early on into Halo 2's release. Uh, but if I remember right, books and the the book series that released for it didn't come until a few years after, and I think it was around to coincide with Halo 2's release. Right, okay. So is they're not necessarily written before the games and the games followed them. It was more of a dramatic retelling of the game itself. The first one was just after the game. After the first. The first book, yeah, so the, the first book was Halo The Fall of Reach, written after the right. game released. So, oh, of course, because yes. Reach was set before Halo 1, wasn't it? Yeah, okay. not maybe not an afterthought, but they were probably built to sort of flesh out the Halo universe. It adds to the merchandise. Yeah, they wanted to sort of build a universe around Halo, maybe to sort of set up the the coming stories and the direction that the the game was going to go in. So going back to the library a second, I uh, had a thought. You is that in this mission, you have to te- you team up with the Covenant, right? In some capacity, yeah. You, You're at you least find not a common enemy towards them. Yeah. Yeah. You have to work together to defeat the flood, otherwise everyone's dead. And I just had a thought where I suddenly realized Halo Three does the same thing. Right, you start against the Covenant, then you find the flood, and then you join up with the Covenant to fight the flood. Unless I'm misremembering that, but is that the same arc they used for it Halo Three? It is sort of effectively, yeah. I mean, the the Halo games definitely had a sort of similar pattern in terms of their plot right um yeah Maybe so halo one halo one yeah the, the flood sort of arrive and the, the pattern is that the flood sort of arrive and throw everything into chaos is the theme and i yeah. think halo one halo two and halo three halo two is a lot more about the com- political sort of conflicts and behind the scenes about the the covenant r- sort of religious mythical hierarchies that exist and introducing the arbiter as a character to build him up for halo three what a boy where the the grave mind comes into Ooh, things grave mind, yeah and they have a sort of more major role in the story. But what's also interesting is eventually, I'm fairly certain, you even team up with the Flood. Yeah, there is a point in Halo 3. You go and kill the, oh, the leader god. I, I'm so bad with names. The, the, the priest-like guy. And the Arbiter, you know, runs him through with the energy sword. And then on the way back out of that, you're with the Flood. That's it. Prophet of Truth. That's the one. You're fighting with the Flood, at least just not against them. Until you're at least out of the yeah. building, and then they're no longer your friends. But yeah, the sides do change quite a lot. Yeah, and that happens, if I remember right, what happens there is that the the prophets, um, the prophets use the brutes, the big sort of monkey people, right? And they sort of start, uh, they want to activate the halo rings to destroy the flood. And if they activate the halo rings then that will wipe out all life in the universe, human included. Yeah. Now, the Flood don't want to be destroyed. The Arbiter doesn't want to see the humans and the Sangheili, the elites, destroyed. And, um, obviously, Master Chief doesn't want the human race to be wiped out. So, the Flood, Chief, and the Arbiter all sort of merge together to fight against Prophet of Truth. Mm, doesn't Guilty Spark wants to um, activate the rings in Halo 1? Yeah. So he's some sort of computer that, whose goal is to wipe out the flood. Sure, yeah, yeah. And that comes in the very sort of, again, it's, you know, they a theme of AI, they like to focus on, you know, computers and artificial intelligences and their programming, and both Cortana and 343 Guilty Spark are sort of different sides of a, a coin in that way. And it's inevitable an AI tasked with some huge responsibility like that is going to get it wrong in some way. They're going to compromise in some disastrous fashion. 
you see that in all sorts of cinema and games. And so, I've, yeah, so 343 Guilty Spark by the third game, and even a little bit in the first game, you know, where he, he turns from the blue eye to the red eye, oh, yeah. evoking uh, Hal 3000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. drawing on the, the fear of technology. And uh, the, the idea that, you know, maybe AI, which is meant to be our saviour, uh, and it is certainly in the Halo universe, they, they are the forerunners relied on things like Guilty Spark and things, you know, to to run the installations. Installation 04 was Guilty Sparks, and, you know, they were set to, to watch over these things, and then the fear of what computers will do when left to their own devices, and that's the same with Cortana and the rampancy of AI. Yeah. One thing that really impressed me with Halo 1, and even some games to this day still manage to mess this up, was when you're firing a weapon, you get that feel of impact and weight, right? Even though you have no physical kinetic response to it, you can't, you, your mouse doesn't shake or anything like that, sure. When you get controllers that vibrate, that's neither here nor there. You really feel like those bullets are leaving that gun and they are hitting that target because every bullet gives a response whether it hits a wall or an enemy the enemy will flinch and react, the shield will flash if they're a, a, a jackal, I hate those things With their shields. Damn shields on the jackals man. And when they got a binary rifle or beam rifle, whichever it is binary, I think it was much later on, beam rifle they are they are so annoying. But yeah, just, just the, the gunplay, I guess, the, what the word would be for it, yeah. was so good in Halo 1, it's so much better than some games today, and it's such a hard thing to describe like how it would be good, how it would be bad, what you would change to make it better, it's just an overall feel, like I think of sound and visuals, and the timing of it I suppose, but yeah, very difficult thing to describe but they nailed that in Halo 1, in my opinion Yeah, one of the things as well that Halo, and, and well, that was also something that, you know, uh, first person shoot was then sort of strived to achieve going forward after that. And another thing that Halo sort of birthed around that same time was uh, there was a slight shift in the the way that protagonists of shooters, uh, you know, were portrayed. So originally they would be time splitters, things like that. There were very few master chief like characters as in big cybernetic or big masked uh characters uh, obviously you had samus sure yeah uh, your master chief however after that just think of the countless character big burly masked <laughs> characters that came after it i mean from crisis 2 to haze dead space yeah. even yeah, yeah, yeah. had a very similar design destiny yeah uh, obviously made by the same people but you know, the, the way that characters were seen, the way that main characters were done in first-person shooters were, were slightly, you know, it were noticeably affected by Halo. I think as a design choice these days, that just saves money on having to render faces. And it probably did then. True, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when you first start Halo 1, you're in the, the tutorial, and they're just getting you out of cryosleep, and they're popping the explosive pins and stuff. And you turn to look at the guy speaking to you, and he has two frames to his face it's it's closed mouth and open mouth <laughs> that thing is just waggling up and down really quick as he's telling you to you know use your armor and look here look there and that tutorial sequence as another thing i thought that was masterful i know it's just a tutorial sequence right but most tutorial th things in a game, they are that they usually start somewhere near the beginning arc of a character, but it's typically you're in some really weird situation where your character doesn't really know what they're doing for some reason. And it's like, oh, hey, walk up to this thing and crouch under it, walk up to this next thing and jump over it. It's like, well, surely my character knows this. Why are they struggling? And then I obviously I know it's to teach the player, but Halo tied these two things together, Halo 1, where you have an excuse. You've been in cryosleep for. I don't know. I don't think the game really even tells you. Or even, is that the first time Chief wakes up? I don't know. Has he been, Has he done anything before that? But how the player needs to know how to look around, and Master Chief needs to relearn how to look around, and it ties those two things together so it makes sense why you're in this weird situation of doing these very simple, repetitive tasks. Mm. I, I just love that as a design choice. It's, it's so good. Yeah, definitely. The The way as well that the that introduction not only like you say teaches you how to play the game teaches you the controls of the game it is setting up that story um 
and it is if uh, you know immediately after that happens the control room starts exploding and i think you see an invisible elite sort of come into the room upstairs yeah you do it goes and, and stab goes and kills one of the guys who were handling your task yeah, yeah. And it's like oh okay so this is what's going on now yeah. oh yeah and you have to run around for ages without a gun as well I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, until you get up yeah. there and say that you need a weapon. Keys hands uh, you. But we were saying about thing. red versus blue, and that was one probably the final thing to say about Halo and one of the, and how it hugely influenced things going forward was community, right? Sure. Okay. I mean, custom games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember anything else. I think it may have. I mean, this is more Halo Two, Halo Three, but custom games and Forge and all of these things, but. In Halo One, it had specifically the you know the ability to go into co-op, and there was the at the turn of the release of Halo Two, you had custom playlists, right? And like Halo Waypoint got created. That was around Halo Two, Halo Three. Yeah, I remember Waypoint. Wasn't that a a way to synchronize all of your saves across the games and your characters, your multiplayer characters? Like, yeah, I think that came around your Halo Three. Halo Two multiplayer profile into Halo Three, things like that. I think it handled. Yeah, custom games are amazing. So even today, the I haven't seen recently. It's been a couple of years since I've played it, honestly. But um, playing Halo One Custom Edition, which I'm not sure of the legalities of whether it's legal or copyright or what. I have no idea. But I played the hell out of that. And people would create all these weird and wonderful custom versions of maps, all these custom guns and vehicles, and it was oh, it was brilliant, absolutely amazing. Yeah. And I think that still must have a big following. I mean, until uh, the Master Chief Collection comes out soon, hopefully this year. I don't know if there's a release scheduled for that. It still just says coming soon on Steam. Sort it out, Steam. Um, there's there's no other way to play Halo 1 online. You know, the current hype of Halo Infinite trailers dropping every six months or so, and the Master Chief Collection, and Halo is really coming back, I think. Yeah, there's definitely a interesting future for this this game that started off as monkey nuts blam and uh this this obscure rts interested by apple and so i think it's definitely an interesting future for where halo will end up in the next five years in its so far arguably over 20 year life cycle Damn. at the moment there aren't many franchises that compete with that with the release of Halo Infinite, that will make 19 years since Halo 1's release. Damn. And 24 years since Bungie started work on Monkey Nuts in 1997. It really has been quite the adventure following the Halo series over all these years. This has got to be pretty excited for the new title as well. So, to you, the listener, thank you very much for listening to this pilot episode of the Cross-Platform Podcast. We plan to release more episodes soon, and we welcome you to give us a listen again.